Hey guys, how's it going? I'm just in the middle of a uh, little brief imaging session here. I've got three days of uh, seemingly clear skies trying to test out some of the things that I've brought up in the last couple of videos with some issues I found in my longer term Im imaging session. In particular here, I want to talk about the focusing and my <laughs> efforts to do a better job of focusing with the Batonoff mask and astrophotography tool and some other stuff. So today we're going to hit on a couple of topics. First of all, observations on the new focusing procedure. I say it's new. It's not It's not new to many of you. It's new to me. And I'm embarrassed to say that because of what I'm going to show you. I've been missing out on a lot of stuff. Uh, the second issue that I had in my uh, long-term uh, shakedown cruise, as I called it in the previous couple of videos, uh, are the stretch stars in the ED-102. And I went through a little study to uh, with spacers and whatnot to find the optimum spacers set of spacers to get rid of the flat uh, get rid of the uh, stretch stars and produce a flat field. So how how did we do? This was my first time to actually see it in action, and then some comments on the ASI the ZWO ASI 290 mm mini guide camera that I bought to replace the older ZWO ASI 120 mm guide camera that I had been using, and I wanted to just point out a few things that uh, that I'm seeing with that with that new camera and finally something an issue that I've had ongoing but it's kind of a low level concern uh, but it pops up now and again which is that plate solve 2 doesn't always work uh, which can sometimes bring an imaging session to a grinding halt if plate solve 2 decides it just doesn't want to participate with astrophotography tool in the go to plus plus process of zeroing in on the aim point for a given target and then you've got to do it by hand move identify a star move the target around move the uh, scope around till you get the star where you think it ought to be uh, a bit of a problem that happened on the first day a couple of days nights ago when I was doing this and and uh, I've as a result have been trying out a new or an alternate maybe it's not new an uh, alternate plate solving routine that uh, seems pretty promising all right so let's get started in the past couple of nights two nights and hopefully tonight the weather holds this is the objective I mentioned in the previous videos that uh, I lost quite a bit of oxygen 3 data because the O3 filter went out of focus. Sulfur was okay and HA was okay, but I was losing oxygen 3, so uh, that's a bit of a problem. And in the process of finding that out, I also discovered that I wasn't doing that great of a job of focusing anyway. And so I, I wanted to, to uh, improve my technique there. So, so my imaging objective over the next couple of days, the past couple, past two days, next day, then hopefully into a little bit into next week is to replace all that bad O3 data that I acquired that was out of focus with some good O3 data. And I'm going to start, one of my objectives in focusing is to focus on a star that's close to the zenith. In this case, at the time when the star is visible and my first imaging target, the Crescent Nebula, is uh, just passing the meridian to the west. I can focus on Vega, a nice bright star. It's close to the meridian within 20 degrees, say, and then switch over to the Crescent Nebula and follow it down for about three to four hours, depending on conditions. Then switch to the Elephant's Trunk Nebula, which will pass the meridian and become available. Watch it, record some data on it for two to three hours. And then uh, the Heart Nebula will pass the meridian to the west side of the meridian, and I can collect three to four hours of data on the Fish Head Nebula. The first point of this, quote, new, unquote, focusing procedure is that I want to use a star, focus on a star that's within about 30 degrees of zenith so that the majority of the weight of the camera is already applied to the focuser when I achieve the optimum focus. That way, when I'm pointing 30 degrees off the horizon, there's a lot less weight. And as I transition, if I'm on the east side of the horizon moving towards the meridian, then I'm not adding more and more weight to the focuser. In fact, I've already focused with it, already preloaded, so to speak. The second thing that I'm doing is using the one to one uh, image scale. In other words, I'm displaying the uh, image that I'm focusing on on the laptop in a one-to-one -one sense, meaning that each pixel in the laptop 
image is the pixel of the imaging camera so that the numerical algorithms that I'm using, either it's Batnoff Grabber independently or the implementation of Batnoff Grabber within the astrophotography tool, know what pixels they're using. They're using the pixels are designed to use the pixels of the uh, sensor, not the laptop, but if you only give it a scrunched down view, then you're getting a very optimistic perspective or analysis of your focus in that regard. And so by using one-to-one -one scale, you eliminate that error. Okay, so now let's go over to PixInsight and look at the results of this procedure. Here's the here's an image of Vega I took with the uh, Batnoff mask in place and the luminance filter. I also f checked out the uh, this image with the blue filter in place. Uh, the results are the same, so there's no, in fact, there's no reason to use the luminance filter or the blue filter uh, preferentially as long as you're using a set of filters from the same manufacturer that are parfocal, and so you should be okay with regard to that. Now, let's expand this view a bit and switch to the one-to-one -one mode, and now this is what you're seeing, every pixel on the laptop, it corresponds to a pixel of the image sensor. So it's a fairly large uh, image of the, uh, the Batnoff mask diffraction pattern. Now let's go over to uh, Batnoff Grabber and let's select a capture area. Being careful to only include the diffraction spikes in none of these extraneous windows and let uh, Batnoff Grabber do its thing. As you can see, these lines correspond to the um, diffraction spikes and when we look at the analysis done here again one to one scale this says that yes I am within critical focus so I was never achieving this before when I was using the fit image to the window mode which is equivalent to this within APT and using the uh, Batnoff uh, analysis tool within APT, I was getting a very optimistic assessment of focus when in fact it was out of focus. Now by going to the one-to-one -one scale and focusing on this image, I'm getting a much more realistic and a much more accurate focus. And so this has done wonders for improving the image quality of my subsequent images. And let's take a look at this uh, comparison for the Crescent Nebula. This is an image of the Crescent Nebula in oxygen. Now, much of the data here was out of focus, but nevertheless it calibrated and registered and stacked into a single image of about a little over five hours of data. And this is the same image, again, a little over five hours of data with the focus data. There's a, quite a bit of difference here. Uh, first of all, there's a heck of a lot more detail in some of the, fil you may not be able to pick it up in the video, but there's a lot more of the filamentary detail that's visible uh, in the data acquired within a critically focused imaging system as opposed to this quasi-focused imaging system I was using over here. Second thing that you'll notice, and you can't really see it with these two uh, images that, that are optimally stretched for the, each of the two images respectively, but there's uh, quite a bit less noise in the focused image than there is in the out of focus image over here. And that plays a big part in uh, producing a good image too. You don't want a lot of background noise and it turns out when you're out of focus you're contributing to that noise. So this is a very positive result and, and somewhat depressing in that for the longest time I've been either using a uh, my assessment of the of Bat the quality of the Batnoff focus by eye with my SCT before and before I had astrophotography tool. And recently I've been using the, uh, the wrong technique within astrophotography tool with the Batnoff grabber as it's implemented in that tool. And so going forward, clearly this is the, this is the right way to go to get uh, a good quality data. Also, having done this and getting a good focus from the outset, I was able to do a, a imaging for a, a period of 9 to 10 hours and at no point in time during that 9 to 10 hours did the oxygen 3 filter slip out of focus. So it's pretty obvious that my main my main problems were that I was not achieving critical focus at the outset and B I was focusing uh, too far away from zenith so that as 
the imaging system approached the meridian, I was shifting more and more weight to the uh, to the focuser, and then uh, something that was already slightly out of focus, it didn't take much to take it over the edge with a little bit of slip in the uh, in the focuser to to take the oxygen in this case the oxygen filter out of focus. So this has solved my oxygen three out of focus issue. Uh, plus some other issues, and that this focusing procedure is going to benefit the HA data, RGB, uh, and, and sulfur data as well. So this is the way to go. Okay, so the next issue I'm going to take is a lump sum here. Uh, the first question is, did I resolve, have I fully resolved the uh, stretch stars in the corner of the uh, images produced by the ED-102 and the field flattener? The answer is no. Uh, the imaging study, uh, test study, and spacer study I did and showed a video of uh, recently shows that it hadn't quite solved those issues and certainly when I took that same imaging train out to do the recent image, imaging, uh, imaging that I've done, I haven't solved that problem. So that's still an ongoing issue. Uh, the second thing that I was trying was was the uh, ASI 290mm Mini, replacing my previous guide camera, the ASI, the older ASI 120mm. And I just wanted to show a couple of, of uh, screenshots from the guiding from the uh, recent imaging I did the past couple of nights. This is a, a picture of the, uh, the PhD2 gra uh, image screen, of course, we're all familiar with. This image over here is the uh, imaging screen for the ASI 290mm Mini. There are a couple of dots here. I've got the gamma turned uh, set such that you can't really see any of the uh, other stars. I'll, sh I'll show you a different view here in a second. Over here is the guide star. You can see that it's stretched. And the reason is, of course, with when I'm looking through an off-axis guider, I'm pulling out a star that's uh, in effect, if, it, if the field isn't flat, then I'm looking at a stretched star. Now here, this looks a little more optimistic by virtue of the fact that I've turned the gamma such that I can only see the central core, in this case, elliptical core of the star. Uh, but if we turn up the gamma, you can see that the star is actually a bit more extended. Now hopefully the algorithm that finds the centroid of the star is not uh, confused by this weaker tail that projects out here in this non-flat field. But on the good news side of things, this uh, ASI 290 can see quite a few stars. I'm really impressed with the uh, sensitivity of this camera, and there are a number of uh, uh, guide stars available to use uh, with this camera. I don't believe I, I was able to resolve this many guide stars with the ASI 120 mm. So this is a, a positive uh, a positive step. I'm really pleased with this camera. Unfortunately, at this stage, using this camera through a off-axis guider, I'm picking up the stretched stars in a non-flat field. So that's unfortunate. But that's not the can that's not the guide camera's fault. So I'm I'm okay with that. This is an excellent camera. I highly recommend it to anybody who wants to use this camera. It's particularly well suited for smaller off-axis guiders like the ZWO off-axis guider because typically you have a smaller prism and therefore there's no point in purchasing a guide camera with a large sensor if only a fraction of that sensor area is going to see light uh, projected up to it through the um, through, by the prism in the off-axis guider. And this one, this particular size of this sensor is, is uh, perfectly well suited and I can use the the majority of this sensor, if not all of this sensor, uh, when paired with the uh, ZWO off-axis guider. Okay, another issue that came up, I didn't mention this in the previous videos, but occasionally I've had issues uh, when doing plate solving. I use uh, astrophotography tool, the Go To Plus Plus feature, which allows you to identify coordinates of your uh, imaging point, your target point, and then tell APT to go to that point by using a iterative uh, imaging plate solving uh, routine. Uh, now that all <laughs> falls apart if your plate solving doesn't work and occasionally maybe about 20 percent of the time plate solve 2 that uh, is one of the plate solvers in APT that APT uses or relies on 
simply fails to give a result. And that happened uh, right out of the box when I started imaging on the Crescent Nebula, or tried to start imaging on the Crescent Nebula this a couple of nights ago. It simply would not find the Crescent Nebula, even though it found Vega, just a small hop, skip, and a jump, astronomically speaking, away. It perfectly resolved and found that star, but when I made this small step over to where the Crescent Nebula was, it wouldn't solve the field. And then you, of course, spend 20, 30 minutes trying to maneuver the scope around so that you can uh, start your imaging session. So that's a real pain in the neck. I've uh, been on the forum with APT and have seen several references to the astrometric stacking program. And it's a, it's a program that has more capabilities than just uh, plate solving, but it is a very effective plate solver. And many people were commenting on how fast it was relative to uh, plate solve 2. So I thought I'd give that a shot. Let's go over to the website of the Astrometric Stacking Program. So this is the main page for the Astrometric Stacking Program, ASTAP, and you can see it's www.hnsky.org slash astap.htm. Uh, I have a Windows 64-bit system, but this software is compatible with a number of operating systems, so this should not be a limiting feature. I just downloaded the uh, G17 star database installer and the uh, ASTAP installer and put those into a directory called ASTAP. Let's go over to that directory. This is the file you download from the website along with the ASTAP setup uh, program. Just put them in the same directory, run it, and this will this file will extract all of the star files, index files that you'll need to do plate solving and then the ASTAP setup program will install the ASTAP software. The next thing you need to do in order to use this with uh, Astrophotography Tool is go ahead and copy this and then paste it back into the same directory. Notice this ASTAP copy. And then just change the name of this to Plate Solve 2, as I have already done here. So I'll go ahead and delete this. But all this Plate Solve 2.exe is is just the ASTAP program renamed with Plate Solve 2. Now let's go over to Astrophotography Tool to see how we interface this information with Astrophotography Tool so that we can use ASTAP instead of Plate Solve 2. Now I've already loaded up at one of the images it was having trouble solving. It doesn't have trouble solving this particular image, but when I was doing the GoTo++ uh, procedure last uh, last night it was having trouble. This is the crescent nebula. You can't really make it out, but there's a little bit of the essence of the crescent right here. Um, in order to use ASTAP instead of Plate Solve 2, it couldn't be simpler. All we have to do is go to the Gear tab, go to Point Craft, go down to Settings, and up here in the path for Plate Solve 2, just enter in the path for your ASTAP, that separate path or folder that we created to download the uh, ASTAP files into. The only th thing that you got to remember is make sure you have a copy of ASTAP.exe and rename it as Plate Solve. Otherwise, all that the Astrophotography tool is going to do is just go to that directory and think it's dealing with Plate Solve 2 when in fact it's dealing with ASTAP. Now let's do a solve. Well, let's bring in the objects. It's the Crescent Nebula. And we have the coordinates that I use for my imaging for the Crescent Nebula. Press Solve. Image solved. And within one to two seconds, it solves the image. Now let's go back and change this so that we're using Plate Solve 2. I think it will work, freeze up as it was before. But all we have to do is do this. Now this is handy because you can switch easily from between one plate solver to the other and not have to do a bunch of modifications to your system. So once I do that, now when we go to this directory, it's going to go over to the actual Plate Solve 2 software to solve this image. And it's taking a bit longer. Image solved. Now, in this case, it actually solves it in 8 seconds, and, and ASTAP solves it in 1 to 2 seconds. Now, the other night, I was finding that Plate Soft 2 wouldn't even solve this image, and it would time out after 60 to 70 seconds or whatever I had the limit set to. But right now, I am totally sold on using ASTAP uh, 
and uh, we'll see how it, it works going forward. Image solved. There you go. So we can very easily switch back and forth between the two programs. You're not having to delete Plate Solve 2 or any of the index files. There's completely independent installations. It's just extremely easy to switch back and forth between them. All right, so what are the takeaways? Well, first of all, I am uh, appalled at what I've been missing with my poor focusing procedure these past couple of years. Uh, I thought the Batonoff mask when I first uh, was introduced to it was an amazing thing, but I didn't realize uh, how how much error there still is in a uh, Batonoff diffraction pattern tuned by eye or using even numerical resources but using a shrink to fit image instead of the one to one scale. I totally, uh, I'm on board with this new procedure. I'm going to use the one to one image scale uh, with numerical tools such as Batonoff Grabber or the implementation of Batonoff Grabber within Astrophotography Tool. And I'm always going to try to find a star within about 30 degrees of the zenith so that uh, I get most of the weight, uh, the vast majority of the weight of the camera applied along the axis of the focuser. Um, I haven't had any O3 filter focus issues in the past couple of days. I've gotten roughly, uh, you know, 8 to 10 hours each night of, of O3 data and uh, it's maintained focus from beginning to end, so there's no issue uh, whatsoever with that. So that, at least, is a solved issue, and I can start doing a better job with imaging going forward. The uh, stretch stars in the corners of the images for the ED-102 are still present. Uh, I did a systematic spacer imaging study and never did find the a perfect uh, combination of spacers that uh, eliminated the uh, stretch stars. Uh, actually not real sure what my next step is there. I may get enough uh, nerve to try some more uh, imaging uh, tests, but uh, we'll see. The uh, ASI 290mm uh, Mini is an excellent guide camera. Totally, highly recommend it. Uh, it, it, uh, it seems much more sensitive uh, than the older ASI 120 that I had been using. <laughs> and uh, uh, good news, bad news, it perfectly resolved those stretch stars uh, that the o off-axis guider gives me at, with the uh, ED-102. But, you know, hey, that's the, the price of doing business. And uh, I've been having on and off issues uh, with Plate Solve 2 not successfully solving an image uh, in the uh, Astrophotography Tool Go to Plus Plus procedure. Uh, downloaded the ASAP, just as I showed you. Uh, it is... Uh, I don't know. There aren't many aren't many things in this hobby where you uh, the software is free. You plug it in, and it works right off the bat, and it's faster than what you had been doing. It's hard to find a hard to find a problem with that. So I, ASAP is my uh, my go to plate solving program for now. I'll be anxious to try it out with the wider angle 250 millimeter uh, Red Cat 51 telescope, and also the much longer focal length. Um, uh, the SCT 9.25 that I have just to see if it works over those that full broad range of image scales but it works perfectly with the 700 millimeter uh, ED-102 that I have. I suggest you give it a shot if you're having some of the same uh, solving issues that uh, that I've been running into. Anyway I just wanted to update you guys on uh, at least some progress that I've made and maybe a couple of uh, of ideas of things to try out just in case you're having some of the same issues I am. All right, guys, get out there and do some imaging. I know I will be. Got another free night tonight. See y'all.